What's up, Gasol Education Nation? Today's episode is brought to you by The Payday Practice and our good friends Jeff Langmaid and Jason Deach. So how would South Gooden, Gary Vee, and Tim Ferriss create a chiropractic practice? The answer is in this book right here. So our good friends Jeff Langmange and Jason Deach, uh, they created the payday practice to basically show you how you cover your monthly expenses in one day every month. Guaranteed, generating monthly recurring revenue in your practice can create financial freedom, eliminate chronic financial stress, and turn the first day of each month from, damn, it's time to start over, to payday. Get a free copy today at www.thepaydaypractice.com. The Payday Practice will show you the exact step-by-step process that you can use to generate monthly recurring revenue in your practice. Get your free copy today at www.thepaydaypractice.com. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Gasol Education Show. Uh, Taylor Premier, Brett Winchester, we are here at the uh, Tennessee Chiropractic Association's uh, annual event here, and uh, we couldn't help but grab Tim Bertelsman. Uh, we, we got your partner, cried uh, Brandon Steele, at a little bit more of a fun place, I think, in, in Vegas, but uh, this, this, is, uh, this is even better, I think, sitting down with you. Very so, similar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Similar, yeah. People call Murfreesboro the the uh, the Las Vegas of Tennessee, right? So. We can't figure out how to pronounce it. Yet. Like we we struggled the whole way down here trying to figure out how you even say the name of the city we're in. Exactly. So, so Tim, uh, obviously everybody knows you from Cairo up, but uh, you're also well known for for how good you have a clinician you are. Number one, but then number two, you kind of have this uh, uh, mystique, and Brandon actually talked about it on the podcast of your ability to kind of sift through research, but not only research, but also research that matters. And so that's, I think, what the topic of today is going to be about is, one, how do we how do we disseminate research, one? How do we figure out where it applies into practice, two? And then uh, kind of maybe how that all fit into how Cairo Up became where, where it was. So... Yeah, awesome. Good questions. Way too many, though. Uh, so. <laughs> so, so I think the, let's just start with Cairo up. So Brandon kind of gave his his deal on how it all started, but uh, maybe give us uh, you know your your kind of quick story on where Cairo up started, what it is, and then you know what where it's going. Put it that way. Yeah. Could I see what he said first? I, just, <laughs> I want to make sure we're close. Uh, it, it, yeah, yeah. I did get to hear his podcast as I listened to a lot of these podcasts. Awesome. Um, and what he said is true that you know we sat down and we were always brainstorming what can we do to help elevate the profession a little bit. We're both involved in our state associations and, um, you know, associations always have ideas as to what what are we going to implement to help make this a little bit more effective. Um, and so we decided that really it's not something that we can legislate. It's not something that you can push people to. It's just something that you have to lead people to. And some people like yourselves have figured out how to, how to find that knowledge. But for a lot of people in practice, you know, life gets busy, that you have lots of responsibilities. You're running a business, you're running a staff, you're doing things that you are, aren't familiar with. And sometimes the research and staying up on clinical skills falls behind. And that means we all fall behind because we're not using what's truly most effective. So we said, what can we do? And we decided we'd create some protocols. So like he said, just scribbling it down on a napkin, determining what are we going to do. Our first protocol was for um, a rotator cuff tendinopathy and it really came out of uh, more necessity than anything else so this would have been like 10 or 12 years ago and that's when the concept of tendinitis versus tendinopathy was really coming more on board and I had a patient who came in and she had failed her treatment plan or apparently told me she had failed her treatment plan she didn't show up on the fourth visit which (laughs) you know you know how that feeling feels so good and so I asked, I said, Debbie, she was a hundred percent better. She was, yeah, I thought, yeah, that's what we put in the stats. So, uh, and just in case she wasn't, I said, you know, Debbie, Debbie, where's Mary Garcia? And, and so this was 12, 12 years ago, pre-hip, I can say that. And she said, uh, oh, Mary called in and she said that she's not feeling any better and she's not going to be coming back and she's going to go see her doctor. And so anybody who's had that, which we all have in clinical practice, failed cases, Uh, you know that that sucks and it's something that stings and we decided we're going to do something different so we really dove into the research looked at the mentors at that point in time went to classes and and researched what do we need to do differently and learned the concept of tendinitis versus tendinopathy that really I shouldn't have been using ultrasound on Mary I shouldn't have been doing things that tried to ease the inflammation because she had a chronic problem that tendon was degenerating and it was dying and it really changed the way that we approached it. We no longer had to drop to our knees and pray that it was coming from the neck, that it was one of the 50% that was a <laughs> cervical neurogenic referral, and even um, e- even started enjoying those cases rather than dreading them. 
and realized we probably should do this for more than one or two diagnoses. So we went into the second and third and fourth diagnosis. And then we recruited some other people to help us define those protocols. People like Tom Hyde and Stephen Pearl and Jeff Tucker. And, uh, you know, there's a whole list of people who have been super helpful in the project. And so we go into the literature, mine out the best practice protocols and decide what, what do we do with that? And since that point in time, it's just kind of taken off and now it's available to, to access. And we love learning from, from people who are using those protocols. What do you think the biggest gaping hole in chiropractic education is? So, I mean, if we're saying that for the most part, a majority of chiropractors are struggling with what you're talking about. So where, where are we potentially dropping the ball? Do you think? Cause I mean, of course, if, you know, if we're on the side of the schools, they're going to say, well, they got to pass, you know, national boards and there's all these like things that, you know, uh, benchmarks they're having to meet. So where, what are we doing wrong? Do you think in the on the education of our students? You know, I'm not sure that there's anything wrong. I think it's just a constant evolution of the process. I really do think that most schools are doing a really good job. The chiropractors that are coming out today, as you know from your associates, mm -hmm. they're far more skilled than probably what we were for all the investment that we put into our educations. So I don't know that we can completely uh, pin, pin it on the school. I think that the school gives us an opportunity to learn, but then it's seeking out the types of things that you talk about, that you guys really do nail it on the head. That in school you learn how to learn. You learn how to vet information. You learn, learn the basics of manipulation. You learn how to use that magic hammer that gets three-fourths of your patients better regardless of what the problem is. The thing that we need is that the types of skills that can get that other 25% of patients better, at least a good chunk of them better. So all of the things that you teach in, in your Gestalt classes as far as directional preference and neurodynamics and functional types of issues, those are the those are the gaping holes that school just doesn't have enough time to cover. We're dependent upon tools like those things, classes like you provide, to really fill those holes. I think that in school you can get a couple of electives. Would you like diversified or activate or against it? Well, it's it's kind of challenging to learn how to do neurodynamics and how to, how to perform the things that are really needed to get that that upper level result. So I think that's the whole. Just the it really requires another year of school, and it probably requires that another year of school after you've been out for a couple of years to realize what's going to come your way. And it's not Aunt Sally who's been seen 400 times for a you know, kink in her neck. It's, it's going to be somebody who needs something a little bit more, more sophisticated than what we can deliver. Well, I think the other hard part is, I mean, you, you show up to, you know, trimester one at a chiropractic college and you think, well, if I'm great at manipulation, then all my patients are going to get better. I'm going to have a nice living. And what's not told to you is there's so much more to get that patient that's in front of you better. And uh, I think that's why the contemporary chiropractor has really kind of moved to a multimodal approach and where it's basically integrating, mixing and matching different modalities. And that's what you know Kyra Up has really done a good job of doing I think of like exposing the need to be able to do that because honestly I do feel like when you show up at chiropractic college it's almost like it's the elephant in the room that no one's talking about like you kind of think everybody with low back pain is going to get better when you learn how to adjust them well and we all know that's just not the case I mean there is that subgroup of patients that is going to get better but you know it, it's about understanding how to assess your patients well and then you can you know direct the care accordingly. Yeah, classifying that patient as to what's going to be the most benefit. Brandon talks about that all the time, choosing the right tool for the right patient at the right point in time. Mm -hmm. And we, we do learn how to use that the skill of manipulation pretty well in college, or reasonably well. Um, but but being able to determine what, what do we need to do in addition to that, and that's just for low back pain. You know, when you start moving into other joints and, and addressing where it may be more soft tissue, where it may be more functional, then it gets even more complex. I think it's just a time frame is what's really missing in that gap. And people taking the initiative if they if they want to be Taylor Premier if they want to be Brett Winchester that didn't happen in school that happened by having a passion to continue to cho chase those types of skills that make you that doctor so it's it's time right uh, so what is the what can you say about the future of Cairo up I don't know what is private information from what we talked about before like what is the what is the the tenure plan of Cairo up Get rid of Brandon, really. Yeah, I mean, um, he was dead weight. We got to get rid of him. 
<laughs> he, no, Brand, he's Brand, an anchor to you, Tim. Let's get rid of him. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, you know, we're super fortunate to have him. He's just he's an idea fountain that he produces more ideas than we could ever begin implementing. But certainly, our dream is to continue to our our mission is to advance the profession, to give the profession tools that we can become the undeniable best choice for patients and payers. And we have those skills that if we could reproduce your clinic nationwide, as we talked about earlier, it really wouldn't be a problem with chiropractic utilization. We'd have 90% utilization. It'd be a capacity problem. So that's our goal is to help chiropractors wherever they stand, whether they're a completely straight chiropractor, somebody who's very close to, to being you guys, somebody that everybody can take one step forward and we're looking for those types of tools so our future is to say how do we develop that one of the big challenges is that when new data comes out it takes on average 17 years for that to get into clinical practice Mm -hmm. so when that research study comes out you have to read it you have to teach it at a class somebody has to absorb that in the class and not be backed up on monday morning so they forget what you taught and then put that into into clinical practice and that's the challenge so we'd like to speed that process up We'd love to see those happening real time within an EHR system. We'd love to be able to collect meaningful data that could fuel practice-based research networks that allow us to, to truly show what's happening. That one of the challenges that we face as chiropractors, there's abundant data saying that spinal manipulation and the tools that chiropractors use throughout their toolbox, whether it be neurodynamics or directional therapy or all those things, those are all very potent tools. And even when we look at clinical practice guidelines, the highest form of research, we see that we need to be stopping using medication as a first line of defense for lower back pain. We need to start using manipulation and um, the soft tissue types of things that we use, massage, heat, acupuncture. And every MD has seen those studies of annals of internal medicine and the clinical practice guidelines. The problem is they've not changed their referral patterns because their personal experience trumps that data that if I asked everybody in the audience listening, do muscle relaxants work? If you have an MD in your office, you know, yeah, they do. But if you don't, you you say no, they don't work because all you've seen is the failed muscle relaxants. The ones that work didn't come to see you. (laughs) And if I asked if an inversion table works, it's only people who have an inversion table would say that they work. No, the research says inversion tables do work well for lumbar disc lesions and degenerative changes. We've just never seen one that's worked because they didn't come say, hey, I was going to see you, doc, but I tried my inversion table, so I don't need you. Here's my, my $20 copay. That just doesn't happen. And unfortunately, the same thing happens to primary care physicians. They don't see our successes. They see our failures. They see Mary Garcia's who didn't get better. So although the data that they read, and they're aware of it, they're not, they, their head's not in the sand, they're aware that they should be doing that, but they don't because their personal tr- experience trumps that. They say, you know what, I would, but I've seen so many patients who just aren't getting better or potentially got worse, and I have concerns about this, and so they don't refer. We can change that process, but we need to educate medical physicians as to what we do, and I think one of the big things is just sending a release report to that primary care doctor that when we're done with care, we send a report saying, hey, Dr. Smith, I saw your patient. I treated her seven times. She's 95% better. I'm going to release her at that point in time. And it dispels all the myths. Now, we surveyed MDs a couple of years ago as to why wouldn't you refer to a chiropractor? We went to lunch. We go to lunch with MDs. It's one of our strategies. And so we saw MDs who are friendly that refer to us, some that are lukewarm, and big groups who had MDs who would never refer to us. And we got answers from all of them. And their concerns are, number one, are you going to prolong care? So they don't want an expensive form of entertainment for patients who aren't necessarily going to get better. They also wanted to make sure that we're not going to hurt the patient. They wanted to make sure that we're being financially responsible with that patient. And they want to make sure that we're communicating in a positive way, that we're not discouraging our, their patient from us, utilizing their care, their medications, and their tools, because they work too. And so sending those release reports dispels all those myths that saying, I saw your patient, they're better, I'm releasing them from care, just told them I do communicate. Not only do I not hurt them, but I help them, and I'm also going to uh, release them when they're done with care, and then hopefully they'll be back at some point when they need something else. That can change our world, that if every MD saw every success in our profession, It would change the world for us. It changes attitudes. It changes referral patterns. And I think that's the single biggest tool that we can do to make make a change in the future.
That might uh, that might have been the, one of the best plugs for Kyrup ever because I know that Kyrup also has that tool of, of generating those reports, correct? Well, we do, but <laughs> regardless if you're a Kyrup provider or not, send the report, and I'm happy to, to send the template for that to anybody. That the template is simple. That Dr. Smith, I saw your patient, Mary. She presented on March 1st with a chief complaint of lower back pain. She was uh, established a diagnosis of lumbar disc lesion that's extension biased with hip abductor weakness. I treated her with spinal manipulation extension bias Alice therapy and- uh, yeah rocked it uh, <laughs> she, she's not conscious uh, and um, she's responded well that she's 70 percent better 80 percent better and that's the other thing is in those notes we shouldn't think that we need to make make the physician feel that we're the hero in this process that MDs are not looking for resolution they live in the real world too they know we don't fix everything they don't fix anything and anybody who says they fix everything is full of it so they just want to see that you've done your best and when the patient has done their best that you're going to release them from care so letting the 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 provider know that the patient's good at this point so yeah we we do it through Cairo up but absolutely anybody can do that through the template and I'm happy to send you the template that, that we use for that process and because MDs aren't going to read your soap notes. The soap notes are now nine pages of BS that are puked out by an EHR that when you get the, the, the notes from an ER and from a whiplash patient, you're like, oh, I'm going to check all of these out. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. it looks very much like the cholecystectomy patient from last <laughs> week. And so that just doesn't get read. But what does get read is a quick two-paragraph summary that said, here's what they had, here's what I'm going to do, here's how I'll keep you updated. There's been... A- when I when I think about like taking a history, there's three people that really kind of stick out to me as far as like you know over the years that have like really put a lot of credence into taking a history. One is Carol Levitt, one is James Syriax, and the other one is Robin McKenzie. As far as like being able to ask the right questions. Now, before we got up here, we were just having a talk over a drink downstairs, and you were saying that uh, basically, like asking the key questions is really important as far as like determining what the treatment's going to be. Uh, and it was amazing hearing you talk about like how much you can actually glean from the right question to determine what treatment intervention would actually happen. So the question I'm going to ask you is, what are the key types of questions that the clinicians on the podcast need to be asking to get the answers they need to help direct treatment? That's tough. I'd start with coverage, um, insurance coverage. (laughs) (laughs) Cash. Uh, Yeah, um, I, I suspect that the clinicians on the podcast are, are probably um, could could educate me as to that one. And it's it's as you know, you know, after a few years in practice, you just know that dynamic dance with the patient. But if we can identify what's happening um, with that patient, both from their standpoint and from our standpoint clinically, you know, we talked about the twenty questions game. That if you ask twenty questions, you've played that app. That it can guess you were thinking of, you know. Thomas Jefferson with 80% accuracy. And if you can ask 25 questions, then it can guess it with 96% accuracy. So the mission... I actually think that's amazing because when you told me that uh, earlier, I was like, no way. I mean, to me, that that is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Just just the simple app that you can download on that one is like, how does it guess it four out of five times? The, the name that I'm thinking by asking 20 questions or person, place, or thing. So those are kind of cool. But that's what, what we'd love to see uh, from a coding standpoint. That if we could have something that would allow the patient to put in their data, that you have a 57-year-old male who has knee pain that started three months ago after a round of golf and they have no inflammatory arthropathies and they have a family history of this and, and they're taking this medication and this is the character of pain, that it's sharp in character, this is the intensity, this is what makes it better, this is their pattern through the day and then match that up with your clinical answers as to they have some instability on single leg squat and they have some foot hyperpronation, this patient has some discomfort when I do a patellar grinding test and no signs of laxity, answering those 25 questions then predicts here's probably what should happen treatment-wise, that when we compare that up with here's what that story would typically respond to, then we can truly meaningfully use artificial intelligence and machine learning to help us predict what's going to work for that patient from a treatment standpoint. I think, I mean, the questions can be so simple too. I mean, one thing we, we ask ourselves in our, in our office or our patients, if you have low back pain, 
would you on a on a really bad day of low back pain this is day one would you rather go on a one mile walk or would you rather sit down for 20 minutes like you can keep it that simple and that question in itself is going to direct so much of what the next assessments would be and of course sometimes you got to call an audible but i mean like sometimes the more simple the question and we always start our uh, patient encounters off with why are you here which sounds like a silly question but like a lot of times like the true reason they're there is that not actually what their paperwork is saying. So like, I think like asking open ended questions in the beginning and then starting to act more, ask more directed questions as you work your way through the history. And then what that allows you to do is like, we all know you got to see patients to make money at this game. So like whatever you can do to shortcut the process, you know, is, is very helpful, you yeah. know? And that, that's one of the questions. How, how do you um, shortcut that process? Because really all of that data collection is simple. It's just one piece that there's really no orthopedic test. There's no history question that's complicated. The complexity comes in determining which series of those questions you need to answer. So right. from a clinical perspective, what are the types of algorithms and thought processes that you use to determine what, what's the line of questioning going to be so that you keep your visit short? How do you keep your visit from turning into a... A, you know, an hour ordeal to do every test. Therapy session. <laughs> Therapy session, <laughs> counseling. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, that's a big mistake with the, the younger students coming out. They, you know, they're, they're probably, you know, because they're not assessing all that well, maybe they're spending way too much time with the patient. And I mean, we love it because I mean, they're more this evidence-based group that we're, we're all in, in in these circles, but then they're spending way too much time with the patient. They're over-treating the patient. And, uh, and because of that, they're unable to like have financial success and honestly they're not having great clinical outcomes because they're just throwing so much from a treatment standpoint yeah yeah unfortunately we see that too that yeah, being in practice as you are very well aware of and listeners are as well really is two pieces that clinical hand and the business hand that there are so many times that there are people who are really good at business and terrible clinicians that are successful and unfortunately a lot of great clinicians who have invested in their skills they've taken the time they're patient centric they're interested in doing what's right but they have no business skills and then they they fail and I think that happens too often you gotta you've got to have the business skills but then you've got to make sure that you always put the clinical skills ahead of the business skills when you're making decisions otherwise you're you're, you're not gonna have a practice either That's right. in the ivory towers of Cairo up when you guys are sorting through research what do you you know cuz in especially now with like Twitter and Instagram and Facebook you know, we get new research all the time. I mean, literally, like as you're flipping through your phone, you're seeing all this research. And at first glance, you're like, wow, you know, this is this is interesting. You know, like this is this would be something I'd like to plug in. But then, you know, you get busy and you kind of struggle with, you know, and even what that implementation looks like. So what's the process at Cairo up of like taking research and actually pulling out what can actually be changed in a treatment setting for the the average day chiropractor, physical therapist that's out in out in the trenches. Yeah, so that's that's a great question because early on I think we were guilty of putting too many things in. You know, we would be updating a couple hundred protocols a month with here's a new fact about the etiology of greater trochanteric pain syndrome. And so we've kind of changed the process in order to keep it manageable to what changes the recipe. And the recipe would, what are you going to do from a an assessment standpoint? Now, what are you going to do from a treatment standpoint and what does the patient need to do? So if there's new research that comes out that says, here's a more sensitive test for detecting a rotator cuff tear, here's a better way to assess plantar fasciitis, we're going to, we're going to track that one down, something that changes the recipe. Um, and same thing with treatment and exercise as well. But those other types of things that, you know, there's 24 million PubMed articles that come out on a yearly basis. You can't keep up with those. And they're not all musculoskeletal, but there's a big chunk that are musculoskeletal. So we have a couple of doctors who mine that out of the, out of the data. We use research aggregators to, to look at. Here's the topics that we're interested in. And really anybody can do that, that you can go into NCBI. You can put in your favorite topics and say that I'm really, I'm really interested in, uh, you know, plantar fasciitis or I'm really interested in golfer's elbow, whatever it may be. And then you get sent that research. So you'll see, and you can choose, I want to see the top 10 studies or 20 studies. So really anybody can do that aspect of it. The hard part of it is determining what to use and, and how to make that part of your practice because we learn those things, but then there's these terrible things that are 
that get in the way called patients, that you have three patients waiting for you, <laughs> and you 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 know you you drop your plans to the best laid plans. You drop those and say, I really don't have time to implement that new test at this point in time. So we look for recipe changers. That what's going to make a meaningful difference in that patient's outcome in your in your clinic, and that's what we'll try to incorporate into into the program. So we've seen a the pendulum kind of swing in musculoskeletal medicine and diagnosis to where there's a lot of people, especially in the evidence-based group, trying to tell us that we cannot make a pathoanatomical diagnosis. And I honestly, and I mean, I, I guess, you know, early on I, I was heavily influenced by Stuart McGill, who definitely was of the camp that you, you may not be 100% certain on it, but you definitely have a pretty good idea of what the pathoanatomical diagnosis probably is. And that can start to direct treatment. So... What do you think about you know these uh, these people in this evidence-based group that are telling us that you can't accurately make a pathoanatomical diagnosis? Yeah, you know, I think I think there's credibility on both sides, and I think that we should call them pathoanatomic symptoms. That we realize that it's really the function that's the the issue. That function is what causes pain. That if we have either joint dysfunction or we have muscle imbalances or postural issues. That loss of function is what's going to cause pain or ischemia, which causes pain. So we see patients with, with whatever type of symptoms they come in with, but the same functional deficits are going to cause those pathoanatomic changes. It's going to cause degeneration. It's going to cause ischemia to the tendons eventually and degenerative tendons. It's going to cause spurring and stenosis and meniscus lesions and slap tears. All of those things that show up on our imaging tests and show up on the patient's reports and patients, I think, get most confused thinking that those pathoanatomic changes are what's causing their pain. No, those are pathoanatomic symptoms. They came as a result of a functional deficit, and if we address the functional deficit, we'll be able to resolve the pain that goes with it, and the symptoms may or may not change. If it's a tendinopathy, it has the ability to heal. If it's a bone spur, well, good luck. It's going to be there forever, but you're still going to feel okay. So I think that the, the challenge is recognizing that those changes, those structural changes, are not the cause. I think that they are an important part of the process to understand it. They're also part of the process that helps us pick a treatment. Because we know that if you have a degenerative uh, change in your spine and you have stenosis, that yes, that may not be what's causing the problem, but you probably will benefit from some traction. If you have a meniscus lesion, you may benefit from doing some directional therapy. So having that diagnosis helps us identify what treatments are going to be effective for that patient. But I don't think that the diagnosis, the pathoanatomic diagnosis, should be the end point. There's kind of a new in vogue term that people are using now called like clinical prediction rules. So it's kind of been, it's kind of replacing, you know, what was like orthopedic testing or a cluster of orthopedic testing. Uh, I know you guys still use orthopedic testing as we do too. What, what do you think about like these new clinical prediction rules? Are you guys utilizing them? Um, how much credence do you put in the orthopedic tests that we were all taught in school? Yeah, I, I love them that, um, you know, we know that short of Finkelstein's test, there's really no pathognomonic uh, orthopedic test that's going to give you a diagnosis. So I think we've all used clinical prediction rules through our practice that we know when you put this plus this plus this, the likelihood goes up. And that really comes with just the experience of a clinician. But if we had a system that was able to identify what's the likelihood based upon those tests being positive, then that would, that would be really helpful. So that's our goal is to help develop that system. Well, I mean, and that I was kind of teeing you up for the next question, which is if you're a younger clinician, even if you're coming out like number one in your in your class or whatever, you know, like and those those people we're used to dealing with, uh, but you don't have experience. So how do you get around the fact that you haven't, you know, you're competing against somebody who's got 20 years of experience? You may have more knowledge. You may have taken more seminars. You're doing a better job. However, your the buddy down the street is been at it for 20 years so one way to get around it though sounds like Kyra up is kind of starting to be able to help help clinicians with that by gathering the right data on the front end yeah that that's the goal is is to provide those resources up front right when you're using them when you're seeing the patient along the way um and and just uh helping people recognize too that you know, there are so many orthopedic tests and we can use all of them. They all have different sensitivities and specificities. And when you start mixing them together, you have all sorts of different clinical prediction rules. But in reality, all of those orthopedic tests do one of three things. They either push on it, they pull on it, or they make it work. And there really aren't any others. You know, I always think of it that you had Zog the caveman who, who used to whack people with a 
club and and they say i feel better zog thanks and then all the other cave boys and girls got jealous because they wanted to whack people and make the money that that, that dr zog lived in his nice cave and so they decided you know what we're going to start hitting people with a with a stick and so zog said you know I've, i'm going to screw you guys up i'm going to throw in some orthopedic tests you can't treat people till you test them <laughs> and so everybody says so zog you know sticks them with a, their stick instead of just wax them and says oh it hurts there and then he whacks them there and so then the other cave people caught on to that. And then Zog said, you know what? I'm going to really mess you up. I'm going to name all these things. I'm going to call it the Fortin Finger Test instead of poking your back with my club. And we're going to call it Finkelstein's Test. And we're going we're to call all these things that we can't remember beyond national boards. And in reality, all we need to do is remember that the orthopedic tests do one of those three things. Push on it, pull it, and make it work. So whatever tissue that you're looking at, if you're looking at a structural diagnosis, either push on it, pull on it, or make it work. And if you think of those, then you really can make up your own orthopedic tests along the way and determine how many times can I stress that tissue in one of those three fashions and elicit symptoms. And if so, then that's probably your your structure that, that's causing it. And then the bigger challenge is to determine what's the function that led to that in the first place. Right. That's right. What do you, so how do you reconcile when we're wanting to be looking globally, you know, working on the whole kinetic chain versus like in the orthopedic world, someone has a shoulder complaint, you know, all treatment obviously goes direct it right at the shoulder. In, you know, Cairo up, it would be so easy to kind of think more like an orthopedist, I think. So how do you take into account what's going on globally in uh, the Cairo up model? Um, I think making sure that you've identified the functional deficits, that yes, there's a structural problem with the rotator cuff, but what really triggered that? We know that it was probably a, a matter of there was some scapular dyskinesis. And why was there scapular dyskinesis? Because maybe they weren't rotating their hips. Maybe they didn't have a great enough flexibility in their, in their lumbar spine or their sacroiliac region. Maybe they didn't have core stability. So looking at those common functional deficits, and we, we teach about you know seven common functional deficits, which there are an infinite number of functional deficits, but really when it comes down to it that um, if, if we can identify that there's scapular dyskinesis or there's upper cross syndrome, if somebody has spinal instability, if they have dysfunctional breathing, if they have hip abductor weakness, if they have foot hyperpronation, it'll go a long way. Because I think one of the things that we get caught up in is we get into techniques and we get into programs and thinking that we have to have perfection and, and address every part of that. That we have to address a big chunk of the problem. If we think of a problem like a water glass that overflows, that the patient can be dripping into that their whole life and there's no issue until that last drip overflows. Now they have symptoms. Well, at that point in time, they seek care. So we as chiropractors do something to drain that glass, and that may be using your activator, it may be manipulating, it may be sprinkling wiffle dust on them, whatever it is, they get a drip out of their glass, the symptoms go away, and they leave the office. But then life comes back in play, and it drips back in their glass, and here come the symptoms again. So I think that functional chiropractors and biomechanically oriented chiropractors say, I need to do something to get rid of those things that are filling the glass beyond just the joint dysfunction. I need to address their foot hyperpronation. I need to give them some core stability exercises. I need to help the way their shoulder blade moves and I te need to teach them some ADLs to, to avoid the workstation stress that's being placed on them. And by doing that, we take out some of those functional deficits that were filling half their glass, making life more likely to overflow their glass. But I think that there needs to be a balance between trying to completely empty a glass and trying to get a glass down to where they can live a comfortable life without a significant risk of it overflowing. Mm -hmm. And so that's the challenge that we have as chiropractors. We could spend many, many, many hours emptying glasses. And we could also be really lazy and try to just get a couple of drips out with our wiffle dust. But if we say, let's, let's reasonably drain this down to where there's a good amount of capacity and then see, can the patient, can the patient live there? Because all of the tissues in our body have something in their glass. It's just whichever one's fullest is the one that's ready to go. And then I asked you this earlier before we, we uh, turned on the camera and the uh, recording, but how do you take into account for the central sensitized and chronic pain patient, which we're all going to see throughout our day. And these are the, these are like the big roadblocks in our schedules in a day where, you know, you're so used to seeing something, something being so straightforward and easy and you plug in what you think is going to be the right treatment. And because they're in this chronic pain hospital, if you will, you're not getting the outcome from the pain standpoint that you're used to getting. So how does Cairo up take into account this centrally sensitized slash chronic pain patient? 
Yeah, personally, I just send them to Brandon. I mean, that, that <laughs> makes things a lot easier. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> for out. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we do is make sure that the screening questions include some yellow flags. That what kind of an impact does this condition have on your lifestyle? What kind of a, uh, impact does it have on your work? And if they rate themselves as greater than a two, then we're going to give them some yellow flags questionnaires to dig a little bit deeper. That what type of a yellow flag do they have? Do they have kinesiophobia? Do they have anxiety? Do they have the depression? And then at that point in time, we can help direct that care that if we see that this patient is afraid to move, that they believe movement is going to hurt them, which by the way, every patient believes that movement is bad, that since we've been implementing this system, I think that every patient believes that movement is going to be a problem. Even healthy, mentally healthy patients have that. I don't think there's a point, you know, the first few times I saw it, I'm like, oh, here comes, here's something unusual. Well, no, it's every patient who believes that. And it's just a widespread belief that we've learned that things that cause pain are not good for us. And that's part of the chronic pain conundrum that people uh, can upregulate, our brains upregulate or downregulate any experience. And if it, there's a clock ticking in a room and you hear the clock and your brain says, what's that? And another part of your brain says, that's a clock. And another part says, is that a threat? And says, no, it's a clock. So your brain forgets about it. But the same thing happens, you're lying in bed at night and you hear a tick, you're like, what's that? And your brain says, that sounded like a door. And another part of your brain says, is that bad? And says, yeah, haven't you watched the axe murder mysteries? And, and it was, so I better listen really carefully to that same sound. And our patients do the same thing that they have a knee pain or a back pain and they believe that if I go for a walk it hurts so I better not do that. And I've come to learn that every patient has that belief, even healthy patients, that I would believe a, a good chunk of our chiropractic profession still has that belief that if it hurts then, then don't do that. But we need to encourage those patients to nudge that discomfort, to make sure you know the butler type of process, to, to say what can I do to nudge that discomfort each day and recognize that pain's not bad, it's therapy. Because most of these issues are from a lack of mobility or a lack of vascular flow or a lack of function and there's no better way to get function than to challenge those tissues in a healthy way right love it yeah what a great conversation today guys yeah. uh Give us, give us your 30 second promo for Kyra Up and then where they can find more information. I mean, uh, you know, what, what, what's, uh, what's kind of some of the new features? I think even me uh, going through uh, Cleveland University, we had Kyra Up, but Kyra Up has evolved so much further than what I saw even when I was in school. So maybe just some of my classmates or some of the people that kind of saw the original version that maybe haven't set their foot in, what, what's, what's some of the new, new stuff? Yeah, uh, just trying to continually evolve and some of the things that we hit on today, that that's our, that's our goal, to uh, develop algorithms that have some machine learning built in that we can take those best practices and apply them to real clinical practice in, in your daily workflow. We would love to see that happening in an EHR. Um, we would love to be able to truly harvest that research real time, that right now we do it all manually. We, see, we don't see anybody's outcomes except the top three providers within uh, each diagnosis. And that's manual, we have to reach out to them, but if we could actually see that real time, that would be fantastic to, to be able to let us learn from each other. If we could take your recipes and then you could take your recipes and blend them with other experts' recipes to truly have the best recipe and have that put in your face based upon what 25 questions said that treatment is, is most appropriate for, I think we'll really have something that I, I truly believe that our profession has more viable tools than most any other profession. The future of healthcare means we need to have better outcomes, we need to have higher patient satisfaction, and we need to do that at a lower cost. That cost-effective, and evidence-based patient-centric chiropractic care sits in the driver's seat of that. Now it's a matter of collecting that data and making sure everybody knows about it. So that's the future of Cairo Up. that our goal is to, to promote the profession to make us that choice. And uh, that's our goal. We'd welcome anybody on board who'd like to check it out. The nice thing about Cairo Up too is uh, they're always looking for more people you can try for free. Uh, the customer service is amazing. Uh, it, it's, you're, you're literally doing the Lord's work for chiropractic and, and we really appreciate that because uh, there needs to be more utilization. People need to know what we're doing more and, and uh, to help kind of shortcut some of these things. And, and I don't like the word shortcut necessarily, but help the guide, maybe that would be a better way of saying it. And so to, to give people that are maybe a little bit lost or uh, maybe struggling with a certain diagnosis to be able to have some experts to, to kind of lean on a little bit. And uh, I think that's what, what the great benefit of Cairo up as long as some of the other statistical uh, analysis and other things like that. So. Yeah. What do you think, uh, as we're wrapping up here, we've had Mark Miller on who they started IMC. And in the private insurance sector, their, you know, their way of getting paid is through a case rate where we basically take 
if we get the ICD-10 code right, we say, okay, you have a lumbar disc herniation. We basically know on average, it's gonna be this amount of visits and it's gonna, um, we're gonna reimburse you $900, let's just say as a clinician. So you get $900 whether you see them once or whether you see them 20 times. So for once, the whole system is being motivated by seeing the patient less, which is even like in our world right now, you are still financially motivated to see the patient more. There's still an incentive to see the patient more because of reimbursement. So the question is, do you, what do you guys think in a Cairo up as far as like, uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Like the case rate where you're basically given an amount of money depending on what the diagnosis is essentially? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and that's what we're preparing for that, you know, there's, there's been this change coming in health care for a long period of time. In reality, it hasn't changed a whole lot in the reimbursement model. It still is that you're going to get paid for your service. So there is a disincentive to be efficient in that process. You know that there is truly an incentive to be efficient because the number of patients in your clinic is based upon your product. The quicker that you get patients better, the more busy you get. The longer that you hang patients around, yes, you made a little more off that patient, but ultimately you've lost money because you're not as busy. So right now, the current healthcare model that is still based upon a payer system, a third-party payer system, there's also not a massive incentive for that system to have the most efficient care that if you have a major health carrier, one of the commercial carriers, the rate that they can charge is dependent upon the money they put out. And they can only charge X percent more than that. So if you want to become more profitable, you can either get a whole lot more people on board or you can have more costs so that your rate goes up. Well, one of them's a lot easier than the other. So there's not a massive incentive from a commercial standpoint to truly bring the cost down until you get into these private pay systems to where it's now they are interested, they, they're self-funded, and they're very interested in making sure that, that that care is the most efficient. At some point in time, it's going to be challenging for those, private, those uh, commercial insurers to compete with that system. Because if you're competing with the average Joe and you're getting paid X dollars for a visit, you're going to kill that average Joe. And at some point in time, I see that, that transition happening. So I, I believe what you're saying will happen. At least we're hoping that's what continues to happen because I'd like to re be reimbursed by case. Right. Absolutely. Beautiful. Well, uh, last minute, ChiroUp.com. Uh, you guys are awesome. We love you. Uh, we, we appreciate what you guys are doing. And uh, you're out here grinding in some state associations. I know you're, you're not traveling quite as much as you have been, but uh, I know you and Brandon's classes are always well worth it. Great information. Today you're walking around with your giant scapula. So uh, I love the props and, and everything like that. So uh, we, we love it. And uh, go check them out, ChiroUp.com. Uh, Last little thing, Brett, we, we got some great courses coming up. I, I always forget to announce this at the end, and so I'm going to give a uh, last plug. We got DNS Pediatrics coming up uh, second weekend in September, and then my personal favorite course, TMJ Dysfunction with You, which is the, the third weekend in September. So mm -hmm. I know that that's a passionate project. Uh, we just did one with uh, Dr. Bremer, our dentist, and uh, so go back and check that out. But uh, otherwise, guys, uh, thank you for listening. Thank oh, you, Tim. Lindsay Muma, you better announce oh, that one. Oh, shoot. <laughs> That's a, that is a, a really, really important one. Yes, so uh, Muma and Boland, uh, our fantastic duo, uh, is going to be in Annapolis, Maryland, October 8th and 9th. And so uh, that's literally the best. Uh, we had a couple people on, on social media uh, ask about pelvic floor classes. That is the number one pelvic floor class. I mean, it is by far. DNSC, we touch on pelvic floor quite a bit, but I feel like they've done such a good job uh, of kind of summarizing it for male and female, honestly. It's mm -hmm. it's a postpartum course, but it, they, they talk about everything. And so uh, that course is an, an amazing encompassing for the perinatal population. So beautiful. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate thank you. It, thank you, Tim. Thanks, yeah, thanks for yeah, having me. And, uh, thanks all right, for guys, all you do. Good luck with patience and uh, chiro.com. Check it out. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Uh, if you liked it, share it, subscribe to it, uh, send it to your friends, send it to someone that needs to hear this message. Uh, we really want everyone to be able to, to tune in and, and get the, the best clinical advice that they can, which uh, we're hoping that we're giving to you with these special guests. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us, or if you have any suggestions on upcoming uh, conversations, let us know. Uh, for a list of our upcoming courses, we're adding them all the dang time. So go to gestaltedu.com, click on courses, and they'll all be right there for you. All right, have a good day.